started the recorder. So I didn't know anybody was going to show up. I was going to do it anyway. I'm surprised. I thought that Clyde, I thought he was coming. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. We're working on session one for this weekend. Um, we're still working on the Holy Spirit workbook. By the grace of God, we're going to press ahead in that and try to reach uh, to the end. I think we're just kind of part one, uh, which has been five chapters, uh, and see if we can make it through that by tomorrow evening. Anyway, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we worship you, bless you, thank you for this great and awesome day. We exalt and magnify you, Lord. You alone are King of kings, Lord of lords, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Father, we thank you for the joy and the awesome day that you've given us this day. Open our understanding. Open our hearts and our minds to grasp the truth of everything that you're communicating to us. We give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and some of the different attributes and the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And what we're looking at here uh, in this slide is going to be mankind came to life when he was impacted with the breath of God. Let me back up one slide here if I can get it. Come on, baby. I think I went too far there. All right. We, we looked at the names that were associated with this person. Spirit, Holy Spirit, Eternal Spirit, Good Spirit, Free Spirit. And we looked at the names that were associated with his work. And uh, we need to keep them in mind as we go through and understand that all of the things that the Spirit of God is, He manifests in us, but He manifests to us, and He also can manifest it through us. But if we don't let Him manifest it to us, we're never going to let Him manifest it through us. So it's vitally important that we keep pressing ahead uh, for that understanding. We looked at the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation and the knowledge of Him, the Spirit of Understanding, Spirit of counsel and might. We looked at the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Spirit of grace and supplication. Spirit of judgment. Spirit of burning. Spirit of holiness. And spirit of love. And, you know, that's the way that God knew that we would be able to encounter anybody and, and really show the love of God to them simply is because he placed the love of God in us, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, and the Spirit himself is identified as that love. Spirit of adoption, Spirit of truth, Spirit of life, Spirit of promise, Spirit of glory, comforter, anointing from the Holy One. All of this we've looked at, we, we covered at the end of last session, and everything is is operational. Everything's already effective. It's already inside of us. It's already there to the thing that God is saying, the thing that God is doing. But he's bringing us to the knowledge of that truth simply because he just doesn't want it to be available, but he wants it to be functional. And if there's anything we could use a lot of times in our life is to have that spirit of revelation and understanding and knowledge and everything else so that we're not grasping at straws, or we're not fighting as one that beats the air, but we're actually pressing forward into the things that God would have for us. Uh, it can't be said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, 1 John 4.4. 4. Now in the second session, what's the significance of the word spirit in relation to the Holy Spirit? The use of the word spirit in relation to the Holy Spirit is the most common of all the names and titles. The designation Spirit expresses several things about the Holy Spirit, of course. Uh, first of all, it reveals to us His divine nature, John 4, 24, for God is Spirit. Next, it reveals to us the Holy Spirit as the breath of the Almighty. We look at Job 32, 8, but there's a spirited man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. And also take note that the word in both the Hebrew and Greek for spirit also can be translated breath or wind. The breath of God is also connected to natural life as we understand that mankind came to life when he was impacted with the breath of God. In Genesis 2, 7, for the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils 
the breath of life, and man became a living being. And doing that, we understand that it is the very breath or spirit of God, the pneuma of God, that comes into our life that gives us life, period. And once you're born again, as a child of God, it is the spirit itself that gives you life and the one that sustains you and the one that quickens your mortal body. He's the one that keeps, not just has given us life, but he's the one that keeps us alive. And he's the one that has given us the eternal life. Uh, in the new birth of the Spirit. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life, Job 33, 4. Also, the breath of God is connected to spiritual life, Ezekiel 37, 9, John 3, 6 through 8, John 20, 22. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. Now, in this scripture in John 3, what we have is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, and he's telling Nicodemus, who was a teacher of the Jews, that he needed more than just having a natural, physical birth, even as an Israelite, even as one who was a teacher of the Jews. Jesus speaking to him knew exactly who he was talking to and he was telling Nicodemus that what you have is not enough. You need the Spirit. If you're born of the Spirit, then you are one of God's. If you're not born of the Spirit, then you are still walking around in a flesh body and basically are still nurturing the Adamic nature or the actual flesh nature. And God uh, reveals all through the Scripture, the New Testament especially, that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God, that it takes the dominion and the life of the spirit in the individual, and we have that. We have that through the indwelling Holy Ghost of God in our life, that we have not just a physical bodily life, a fleshly life, but we have the life of the spirit, and that makes all the difference uh, in our life, is the life that we have by the spirit, because the life that we have by the spirit is the exact same life that God has. It's, it's not one like his, it's the same one. It, it's the very expression and the life of God living in us, breathing in us, and, and basically making us one with him so that in all things, no matter what we are battling against, no matter what we are uh, trying to come to an understanding of, we have the ability because of the indwelling Holy Ghost of God to be able to tap into that knowledge. And we have to trust, just like we looked at the uh, identifying factors of the Holy Ghost earlier about the spirit of knowledge and wisdom and understanding, we have all of that. The knowledge, it's already inside of us. And, and the Holy Ghost inside you is able to take the things of God and teach them to you if nobody ever does. We'll never be able to stand before God and say, well, I didn't know, because he'll say, did you not have my Holy Ghost? Well, he probably won't say that. But with the Holy Ghost present within you, we are without excuse, because we, everyone, have been given, God being not, in, not one who shows favorites to any, God will teach you just like he teaches anybody. God will give you an ear to hear, which he already has if you're born of the Spirit. We are able to press in and know even as we are known, and I believe everyone has to a certain degree, but I think we can all agree we can be a lot deeper in Christ than we are right now. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep moving towards the understanding, and that's why we're doing this Holy Spirit workbook, is so that we're not just hearing somebody talk about it, but we're actively participating. Plus, as you have the workbooks, you can take them home, you can look at them, study them, and get to know more. And by the grace of God, I hope, Everybody comes and says, hey, Dr. Hudson, look what I saw, what the Spirit of God showed me in this very thing here. Even the things you were teaching on it, here you touch on this, but this is what he shared with me. That's what I want. I love that because that's exactly what the Holy Ghost is capable of doing is expanding and going beyond. If we talked about everything that we possibly could talk, even about this particular section in John 3, 6 through 8, we, we would be here for months. I mean... 
how long we've been doing it now. We're, we're just trying to get to the end of the fourth chapter. So, I mean, it's a very clear indication that uh, when God starts expounding on the knowledge that he has given us and the things he's made available, there's a lot more to learn than we know at this point. <coughs> but he does say, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. In other words, don't let this throw you. Don't, don't, don't get outside the thing, being born again. Most of Christianity think the very instant you take on salvation, you're automatically born again. And, and I believe some are. I believe the Holy Ghost is fully capable of that. But the thing is, is if you're not being quickened by the Spirit, if you don't understand the Scriptures, if the thing that God is communicating and, and trying to bring life into your vision and, and you're not having that righteous, joyful relationship with God, you may want to check and see if you are born again or not. I know some people say they felt like they've been born again many times. Yeah. That after being, after coming into revelation and knowledge, it, the depth of the Holy Ghost of God is so incredible that he can bring you in such an awakening and open a veil so wide in your life that you felt like you didn't know anything before that. Amen. But that's growth. That's what the Holy Ghost is all about, is moving us from where we were to, to where he wants us to be. And sometimes it's letter by letter. Sometimes it's paragraph by paragraph. Sometimes he just turns pages. And sometimes he just opens a whole new book. But whatever the case is, we have to understand that the work of the Holy Ghost in that is to bring you to life. Amen? I, I mean, when we understand that the Holy Ghost is truly the one, the anointed one in our being who should be living the life that we are now living, that he is far more capable of doing anything that we've ever done. Right. And, and the more we are yielding and understand that we can yield, let, and permit him to do that, the more we're going to enjoy being a part of the actual administration of God, carrying out his will, carrying out his work through us to the point to where the things that we thought we cared about, we don't care about it anymore. Because the most important thing is seeing our Heavenly Father glorified. Amen? Hallelujah. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You can't tell where it goes. You can hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And... It's incredible that we need to focus on something that's invisible. Now, I, I mean, to the natural mind, it's like, yeah, sure, right, I, yeah. Well, the truth is the truth. Amen? That the more that we listen to what he's telling us, the more the invisible becomes visible. Amen. The more that we hear him talk about us, when, when I first started learning the things that God was telling me about who I was, I couldn't see it. I, I said, well, that might be for somebody else or one of these big theologians or somebody or, or somebody who's got a big TV thing or something, but, but that's not me. And the more I got into it, 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 it took a while. But as I began getting into it, little by little, I began understanding that it was me he was talking about. That the more he unveiled, the more I wanted him to unveil. The more I saw, the more I wanted to see. The more I, I could hear, the more I wanted to hear. <clears throat> so when you're driven by the Spirit, you're, you're moved in directions that make no common sense most of the time. It doesn't have to be logical. Say that with me. Say it does not it does have, to be logical. have to be logical. Amen. But if there's anything God has proven to us over the years, he does things that's illogical. Makes absolutely no sense to do some of the things God does. But he doesn't. why would you take the Savior of the world and have him born in a manger? Now, that doesn't make any logic. If you took a poll today of where the king of the whole earth and the universe would be born at, they'd say, well, maybe the Ritz Hotel or maybe in the White House or somewhere. I mean, some big fancy place, but God doesn't move the way man moves. Well, when God's moving in you, don't expect him to move in a way that is common or, or something, it's usually going to be something that just blows your mind. It's like, 
Out of all the things I could think of doing, that was not one of them. But that's exactly what he does. Amen? <coughs> but that's by design. God doesn't want us trusting in the arm of the flesh. That that's when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. They stayed out there and wandered till all the men of war who had came out of Egypt died in the wilderness. Only Joshua and Caleb were left. Amen? Amen. And, and they went in, and they went in like mighty men. Amen? And, and by the grace of God, he wants us to be mighty. He, he wants us to trust in, in the victory that he has won. And the breath of God, the wind of God speaking in us, is going to move you in ways that may may not may not make any sense to you or anybody around you. But it doesn't have to if it makes sense to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you, you, you can hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The thing is this, how predictable are you? And how predictable is your life? How, how well can you predict your life? If our life is predictable, then it's probably not being pushed by the wind of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. If it's so governed, and it is already so scheduled, that we know where we're going to be just about every hour of every day, then we need to get a little bit more wind involved into it. Mm -hmm. we, we need the push of the Spirit of God. When we start seeing the things that God does, it's usually, he, matter of fact, Jesus even told him, he said, when you were in these situations or even delivered up to others, he said, don't take any thought of what you're going to say or what you're going to do. It'll be given to you in that hour or at that moment what it is that you should communicate. Amen? <coughs> How many's ever experienced that? I think we've all experienced it. And it's to the glory of our Father that we have. It's dry in here. Is it anybody else dry in here? Oh, come on, baby. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Amen? If he didn't just lay hands on him, what did he do? Breathe. He breathed on them. What do you think he breathed on them? He breathed on them the Holy Spirit. That's what he was doing. The Holy Ghost was, was upon him and within him. And when he breathed on them, he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He wasn't just trying to let them know he had a new mint breath or something like that. A new breath mint that was working fine. He was, he was saying, receive the Holy Spirit. There you go. Amen. And, and I've seen that happen before. I, I see it happen even with my children. When I got filled with the Spirit, it was a phenomenal thing in my life. And I've shared it many times. I couldn't speak English for three days. And when I got home the first day, my son, who was probably about 10 at the time, come up and gave me a hug. He said, Dad, what's going on? I was trying to tell him. And as soon as that hit him, he said, I want to do it, and he just started doing it. Amen. Same thing happened to my daughter, eight years old. She said, Daddy, me too. <laughs> I, I didn't lead them in no prayer. I was just speaking to them, and I know the breath of God was coming on them, and they began speaking in tongues as well. Amen? <laughs> so don't underestimate the power of the breath. Amen? Yeah. Not, not our breath. <laughs> Yes. But the breath of God coming up. If you have confidence in the breath of God that's in you, and, and you believe that that breath of God that's in you is not a natural oxygen-based breath, but a breath that actually has origins in the realm of the heavenlies, now your breath can be supercharged by the Spirit of God. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Uh, read it. It would do you great to do a... Uh, a word study sometime on the whole Bible on the breath of God. It, it, it would amaze you uh, the things that the breath of God has accomplished and done. But we, we need to see that as a manifestation of the Spirit of God. And here's the thing. It's in you. The breath of God is in you. And if the breath of God is in you, just as Jesus breathed on him and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost, so can you. And I believe also that that same breath of life that is in us can give life to others. God breathed on Adam and he received new life. Amen. Amen. He had never been alive before and God mm -hmm. brought him to life. Yes, I've seen the dead raised. I didn't breathe on them, but I didn't have to because the living word of God was upon me. And I just did what he said to do. Amen. Didn't do it with a lot of boldness, 
But I did it, and he did exactly what he wanted to do. Amen? I, I could have been a rock. I, I could have been a frog. It didn't matter. He just, somebody in that place, place at that time that he could move through, because he wanted to raise them from the dead. And he did. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So if the breath of God is in us, it, it's, it's actually an open declaration or even a proclamation. But it's a confirmation to us that the breath that's in me is not just a normal breath. But that breath in me is actually the spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The breath of God is also connected to the inspiration of the scripture. We're familiar with that. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, literally meaning it is God breathed. <coughs> Reveals to us the Holy Spirit as the wind of God, as we saw in John 3, 8. This thing ain't working very well. There are many characteristics of the wind that make it an appropriate application to the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. First thing, the wind is invisible. Amen? Unless it picks up some material, the wind is invisible. I guess you've probably seen water spouts when it's over the water. What is the wind carrying when it's over the water? It's sucking the water up. It's carrying the water. What is visible is the water. The wind is not really visible. It's what it is packing that is visible. And the same thing with a tornado. Whatever, you can't see a tornado unless it starts pulling up dirt and stuff like that, unless you see the cloud. But now you're seeing water vapors. You're not really seeing the wind itself, the breath. Well, it's the same thing in our own life. You don't have to see that breath to know he's driving you. He's the one that's moving you and inspiring you. Don't look in the mirror and think he's going to be going, hi. You're not going to see that. It's not the case. We have to, we accept and can acknowledge, not just because of the communication of God, the confirmation of Scripture, but we should know He's in us by the relationship that we have with Him. Amen? Amen. <coughs> so how do you know the Spirit exists? The same way that you know that the wind exists. You do not see the wind, but you do see the effects of of the wind. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. They cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So we find ourselves then in a place where God is, is bringing us to an understanding that as He is, so are we. John 4, 24 says God is a Spirit. Now, I, I know it's probably the biggest hurdle that Christianity will ever jump. Because to get our eyes off of the restrictions and the flesh nature that we battled our whole lives and to begin to actually embrace the, the true communication of the Holy Ghost of God that says you have already moved out of the earthly kingdom into the kingdom of God's dear Son. There you are not flesh and blood. There you are spirit. Now, although you are seated there, you are still operating and functioning in a body here. Amen? But the potential, what we are capable of, is who we really are, which is spirit. Now, the body cannot restrict the spirit. The body is the vehicle for the spirit. What can restrict the spirit is you and I. That's the only thing that can hold us back. It's, it's the unbelief in who we are. It's the doubt of, of the one that God has made us to be. And we, we, it, it, when we get to the point where we understand that it's no longer I who live, but Christ, the anointed one, the Holy Ghost of God, the power of God, the authority of God in me, that's who he has made me to be, one with him, that he now has control and life of this body then it becomes a challenge to what do we think God is capable of doing. Now, if we sit down and wrote it down, I think we would all unequivocally be able to write down and say, God can do anything. And then all of a sudden, when we, when we make that statement, now that statement has to come back, can he do anything through you? 
And, and that's where the challenge comes in. And, and if you don't think it will, just wait till the test comes. Because there will be a test. The very instant you start accepting the benefits and the blessings and the manifestations of the Holy Ghost of God in you as understanding and knowledge and wisdom and power and holiness and, and righteousness and peace and joy and love and all the other things that he is and the breath of God, that wind that flows and blows, the very instant you start embracing that, here comes the challenge that's going to see, do you believe what it is that you are saying that you embrace to believe? Now, the, the good thing is we need that challenge. We need that. I do not want to go through life embracing a, a belief that is just simply something that I have mentally assented to. I don't want to just mentally be in agreement that that's what it says. I want the manifestation of God. And, and if I have not moved into the place in my life where I fully embrace it and have no doubt but believe that what God said he would do, he'll also perform it, then I, I want that test. I mean, we have, we have a Christian school here. We had it for 28 years. When, when children come through there, have you finished the book? Yeah, I finished the book. Great, we're going to test you. What? Yeah, we're going to test you. Amen? I, I love it. Clyde and said for a long time, you know, take notes. There's going to be a test at the end of this thing. Well, when they take the test, sometimes they pass it and sometimes they don't. They think they know it, but they don't know it. In the same sense, for us, I can't even begin to announce the incredible and the awesome things that God has communicated to us over the last, well, I've been here 32 years, so at least the last couple of years, right? <coughs> and, and the thing is, where is it? Where are the things that God has said? We, we need to be pressing in to each and every one of those things so that we understand that this was not just a communication that was just thrust out there to, to the wind and then we just move to the next thing. But everything is to be embraced. Everything is to be brought into our being that God is communicating to us because he wants us victorious. He wants us successful. He wants us to not basically head out of this thing the way we came into it. He wants us to, to not come into this thing as, as kindergarten and then leave out of kindergarten 50 years later. Uh, and he wants us to graduate as quick as we can so we can move into the other things. When he told Nicodemus, you must be born again, and Nicodemus said, what, I'm going to climb back in my mother's womb and, and do this thing all over again? And Jesus said, basically, paraphrase, are you kidding me? You're a teacher? of the Jews, and I'm telling you earthly, easy things, and you can't even grasp it? What are you going to do if I start telling you big things? Well, it, it's hard sometimes to realize that we're in the same boat Nicodemus was, because God said, I, I know you're looking like you have a flesh and bone and, and, and blood body, and that that is the essence of your life, but the truth is, that's a lie. <coughs> Excuse me. The truth is that we are spirit. And that spirit is the breath of God, it's the wind of God, it's the Holy Ghost. So we see here, uh, the wind is sovereign. In John 3, 8, the wind blows where it lists, and you hear the sound, we've done been over that scripture many times. But the thing about that scripture is, is that it shows that the spirit does whatever he wants to do. Amen? You, you can read through that Bible front to back. You'll never find where he said, uh, if somebody's got blind eyes, make you some mud pies, spit in it, and stick it on their eyes. It, it's not in there. Jesus did it. You know, you can read the record of that, but you're not, not going to read biblically where it told him to do that. Well, where do you think that came from? It was the Spirit doing it however he wanted to do it. And, and that's where we have to be. Just like when they walk up to the gate called Beautiful, silver and gold, we have none but such as we have in the name of Jesus. Get a walk. That's not anywhere in the Bible. Re read it other than the record of them doing it. Well, where did they get that? It was the wind in them showing 
the absolute sovereignty of God that he can do whatever he wants to do. Amen? He can bring life. He can, he can heal. He can blow the water apart and let them walk through on dry ground. He can do anything he wants to do. As a matter of fact, he can make darkness turn into light. It's incredible that he can cause light to shine, wipe out the darkness, but he can also open the blind eyes and do everything else. It's an incredible thing. He can turn the enemy and, and cause the enemy to be deluded, and they actually are hearing things that really aren't what they think it is, and, and send the enemy running away in fear. He can cause Clyde and, and Teresa and, and, and Bobby and Alice to walk in, and it sound like a million-man army. Amen. You see, that's the breath of God. Now, we need to understand that if God is moving in us to do something, we have to understand he's sovereign. He, this is not something that's up for debate. That what he has communicated is what we move into because you never know what God's doing on the other side of this thing. If he said just walk over there and stand and look at the door, then guess what? That's all you got to do. You, you don't know what he's doing on the other side of that door. Or you don't know what he's doing to somebody watching you look at that door. You just never know what's happening and what's going on. But if we can't obey in the little things, how are we ever going to be prepared to obey in the big things? We, we, we're hoping, against hope a lot of times, that we will obey when the big things hit. But the problem is, is there's no evidence that we ever will. What builds our confidence up is when we are, are obedient in the little things and we begin to see the manifestation of our Father confirming the Word with signs and wonders following. Amen. Hallelujah. <coughs> in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, But all these work that one in the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. And third in this section... I don't know why we're on the double click thing. I don't know if I did something wrong here or what. The wind is mysterious in its movements. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Thank you, Miss Allen. You As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Amen. So I, I think one of the biggest things that, that's hindering us is presumption. Yes. We presume yes. to know the mind of God. We presume to. Yes. You remember, don't forget David. When David was king, the enemy's coming, the Philistines. Do I go out against them? Yeah, get your stuff and go get them. And he did. Well, guess who shows up again later on? It's the Philistines again. Did David say, well, I already know what to do. No. He inquired of God again. And what did God say? Go get them. We'll take them out. He said, nah, go sit in the mulberry trees. Now, that don't make any sense, does it? Go sit in the mulberry trees. Yeah, go sit in the mulberry trees. I mean, could you imagine walking out and telling your staff of generals, what did the Lord say? You might want to sit down for this one. I know they're coming. I know we can see them. He told me to go sit in the mulberry trees. I'll be right back. You know, So you go out and sit in the trees. But, but the other thing was, is God says, well, you go sit in the trees, and when you hear the wind coming through those trees, I'm going out before you. Praise God. Amen? Now, it's that communication. You see, that's the relationship we need. That we don't just go plodding out. God, I screwed up again. I need you to fix this thing again. He said, well, why don't you talk to me before you go screw things up? All right. You know, let's get this thing operational at the beginning, and it might flow a little better for you. Hallelujah. And I believe that we, as we grow more and more, and we understand that the ever-present Holy Ghost of God in our life is there for those particular things. So that we don't have to go out and, and lay down a rug and see if it's wet on the bottom or on the top or 
or anything like that. We don't have to put a fleece out. We have the indwelling best communicator that has ever been. And unfortunately, I have people tell me all the time, well, I just can't communicate with him. Well, communicate with him. He's the best there's ever been. And he knows how to communicate with us. And if we'll accept that we can communicate with him, because he said we could. If you know you're his, then you should also know you can hear him. Yes. And if you know you can hear him, then you need to listen for him. And, and with a righteous expectancy, communicate with the Holy Ghost of God, I'm here before you to hear you. Amen. Speak to me, anything, whatever it is, I'm here. And, and let that voice come. If you don't hear the voice, it's simple. Command your stupid thoughts and my stupid thoughts to shut down. Amen. I mean, God's not going to walk up and go, hello. Oh, he might. He's just never done me that way before. But he will speak, and he does speak. Amen. He wants to speak and probably does speak to us all the time. And our minds are over here and our ears are over here listening to the thoughts and the imaginations and the other things that's warring against the, the actual attention that our ears need to be giving to the hearing of his voice. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. But the wind is mysterious in its movements. The works of God, he makes everything, but you can't guess him. Don't try to guess God. Don't, don't, don't go by popular vote. It, it doesn't work that way. I, I guarantee you, if they would have voted for Jesus to go to the cross or not, it, all of his followers, we know the rest of them was saying crucify. I'm talking about the ones that were in his crew, they said no. No, I don't want you to go to the cross. It wasn't up for vote, though, was it? If the Father had already made that decision. Jesus had accepted that decision and had made a decision of his own. He knew where he was going. It was not up for vote. What God wants to do in you and through you is not up for vote. He already knows what he wants to do. Before you were ever born, he already had charted out everything that he wanted for you to do. What we need to do is to get in line and listen to the voice of the Spirit to move us to the place that God's designated for us to be and just get there. Excuse me. Come on, baby. As slow as I am. Man. The wind is a most powerful force. Even on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. What came? A sound from heaven. Amen? A sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Now, I, I don't know what a rushing mighty wind looks like, but I've heard them, haven't you? Yes. And I've heard the Holy Ghost come that way. It's many different times, and it's awesome. And, and if you'll listen for him sometimes, I think he'll treat you to that because I think he loves doing that. Amen. But he wants to show us that he's not just a wind, but he is a rushing, mighty wind. Very powerful, very forceful. The sound of the wind on the day of Pentecost was not merely a mighty wind, but a rushing wind. The, the thought is of a driving force. Uh, for instance, like a hurricane. You see how the wind on a hurricane will push that heavy water and everything ahead of it before it ever gets there. It's pushing. It's a driving force, and it does that. And, and that the Holy Ghost of God is capable of doing that. And we need to invite him to be that driving force in us. Because if you're like me, sometimes you don't want to get out of comfort zone. But if we need to, if we'll let him, he will drive us that way. Because we're already his. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. 
two laps around the building. <laughs> Acts 27, 14, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Europaia. Now they were on the ship and trying to survive it, Paul and the others. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drop. Now, that's the thing, just like in the Holy Ghost, is that if we'll quit fighting him so much, he becomes the wind beneath our wings. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. When, when we're not wrestling, when, when we're not catering to our flesh, when we're not catering to our own little goals and our own little visions and, our, and my four and no more and all that other stuff, when we're just letting him do it, I mean, maybe God's got somebody else to do your for. <laughs> Amen. You, you hear what I'm talking about? It, is that, I, I mean, we pray and everything else. We want the best for ours. But sometimes we can get in there with our own desires, trying to move things our own way. And sometimes it can hinder. The only one that really knows is the Lord. When... when uh, Brother Clyde, when I first met him and stuff, uh, he was as rough as I am. I'm still that way. Clyde got over. <coughs> but Clyde had difficult times, and when he would, he would he would disappear. And and, and I can't tell you the number of times you go talk to Clyde, you go talk to Clyde, and I'd ask the Lord, and the Lord said, "Leave him alone." Amen. Amen. And you know what I did? I left him alone. And it wouldn't be long. It would come through the door. It'd be my my awesome brother in the Lord, Clyde. And he'd be just ready to just charge hell with a water pistol. And it'd be good for a few months. And guess who disappeared? My brother, Clyde. And it'd be the same thing. But the thing is now, see, God did his work in Clyde because the flesh was restrained from trying to do the work in Clyde. Now, I don't know anybody that knows the story any better than Clyde does. Mm -hmm. He knows the truth. He knows the message. He, he knows the master. I mean, that's what it's all about. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. And as we, as we understand that it's not the flesh that works the good of God, it, it's not the intent, it's, it's not the method of how we try to carry it out based upon past experience, it's what is the wind saying that day? Do I go out and fight the Philistines? No. Go sit in the mulberry trees. Amen. You may feel like, man, all hell's breaking loose in the family. I've got to do something. Lord, what do I do? He says, I go take you a couple days down in Key West. What? Satan, I rebuke you. And then, you know, we start trying to cast that. You know, a lot of times we're fighting against the very wind that's trying to carry us to the place we need to be. Yes. Amen. Don't try to outguess God. And don't let anybody, anybody, anybody pressure you or manipulate you into doing something he's not telling you to do. Amen. If you want divine results, you can get fleshly results, but unfortunately, it's maintained by the flesh. Yes. And, and you show me a, a, a child of God who is, is high maintenance and I'll show you somebody that's not being carried by the wind. Amen. They've been won by the will of man or by the will of the flesh or whatever else. But if you have to keep maintaining and trying to keep them in the place, then you're going to find out that that may be one that was not driven by the wind, but one that was driven by some other means. Best thing to do is leave them alone. When they need maintenance, send them to the Father. Amen. Yes. Let them go get that maintenance. If they can't get that maintenance, they're going to find out. And hopefully, it'll bring them to the place in their life where they do experience a righteous brokenness. Amen. And, and we've all been there before. And, and I'm going to tell you that righteous brokenness or godly sorrow changes you. Amen. And it changes you for the good. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we become, <coughs> excuse me, we become enablers. We just keep trying. Oh, come on, come on. 
Go to church. Come on, I'll pray with them. Oh, come on, do this. And, and we think, and sometimes you just got to leave them alone. Right. What is he saying? I, I know what our heart will say, but I'm going to tell you, the heart of man is, is desperately wicked. It, to think that the natural carnal heart of man desires the same thing God does and, and feels the way God does is only to delude ourselves. It does not do it. It doesn't matter if it's child or grandchild or, or spouse or brother or sister or friend or whoever else. <coughs> Our heart cannot drive us. It has to, we've got to be driven by the wind. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, I, I really, one of my prayers for years had been, Lord, teach that to every minister on the face of the earth. It would wipe out denominationalism. Yes, right? sir. And take it away. Yes, sir. What that scripture's saying is, you can't have your own private interpretation of it. There's one. Hallelujah. And it's his. Mm. Amen? And if we have a thousand different interpretations then at least 999 of them is wrong. And very possibly all 1,000 are wrong. Right. Amen. So when, when we start understanding that it's the Spirit of God who's going to bring that revelation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Here. Amen. Amen. The Holy Ghost knows what he's saying. If we pulled three scriptures out and, and gave them to everybody in this place and gave them a sheet of paper and say, write down what that means to you, what you should be writing is what the Holy Ghost has taught you about that. Not what you heard Clyde or me or Bobby or Alice or Therese or anybody else speak about. It's what do you know about that? Because what you know about that is what you probably believe about that. The interpretation and the understanding of those scriptures should come to you by the Holy Ghost. Doesn't matter who's teaching it. How many times have you heard people teach, and when you heard them teaching, you're saying, "I don't believe that. I don't, I don't agree with that." What, what you're what you're realizing is that you have the active teacher inside you that's calling the things that you don't need to put into your file system. Right? Amen. It, it's calling. And then you hear other stuff, you go, wow, I've never heard that. I don't know. I'm not sure. I, you know what? I do know. That's right. I don't know about it. But the Holy Ghost inside of me is saying, that's God. Mm -hmm. Amen? And, and when that stuff starts registering, we, we should clue in real quick. Thank you, Holy Ghost of God. Yes. Thank you for being there. Thank you for, you rescued me from believing the lie of the enemy. Or you, you brought me into new truth and new revelation, new understanding. I feel like the light has been turned on fresh. Thank you. Amen? Having that relationship, believing in the one who's inside of us to do that and to know that it is the Spirit of God that, that does those things, then we need to let him move. Sometimes, I mean, the Holy Ghost is gonna, can move you out of regions. He can move you out of different things. One, I, I think if there's any one thing that the body of Christ needs to be moved out of is the book of Revelation. Yes, come on. They need to get out of that and, and get over here. They're trying to read symbols and types when they still haven't worked out salvation yet mm. or being born again yet or, or being able to walk in, in the life of the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I mean, all these different things we should be focusing on there over here building charts and plans and, and all this other stuff and writing books about it and having seminars about it. And there ain't a thing they can do about it. And most of what they talk about is wrong anyway. Mm. The, the truth is, take no thought for tomorrow. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You know, that begins to wind that stuff out a little bit. And puts it into perspective. Take no thought for tomorrow because what you're battling and contending with today is sufficient enough for you to be aware of and be alert about. Amen? <coughs> Excuse me. We are not to be blown about by every wind of doctrine, but we are to be blown about 
by the Spirit of God. If the Spirit of God, I mean, how many times has the Spirit of God just blew your mind? I don't mean, you know, I'm talking about, it's like, wow. I mean, just, I can't tell you the number of times I have just fallen on my face before the Lord. I, I can't tell you the number of times I've just had to fall on my knees and just bury my head because of understanding and revelation, uh, freedoms and deliverances and insight and guidance and direction and so many different things that he's capable of doing. If that's not something actively going on in our lives, we need to get in there. Amen. Because we're, we're trying to lean to our own understanding and our own knowledge. It, it'll never produce the result that the Holy Ghost of God will produce. I mean, if anybody, look, look at the nation of Israel. When Jesus is showing up, they were educated in the law and the prophets. They understood that. That was drilled in from the time they were little. <coughs> they had festivals. They had feasts. They had all kinds of things charted out for them. And, and they were educated every year. And, and all throughout the year on all these things. Well, all of those things were absolutely true. And all those things talked about one that they never discovered. And it was Jesus. Amen. And here God shows up right in the midst of the ones who were supposed to know him so well. And they didn't know him. Didn't recognize him. As a matter of fact, they were the key ones to having him crucified. And you see, we wouldn't think we would ever do Oh, I, I would never do that. Well, I, I guarantee you that without the guidance of the Holy Ghost, we'd have everyone been screaming crucify. The only one that would bring the revelation so you would know who he was, was the Holy Ghost of God. Hallelujah. Oh, nobody would ever admit, oh yeah, I'd be screaming crucify. Well, you don't have to admit it. The truth is the truth. If you're not born again, that's the cry of the flesh. Jesus knew how to yield to the wind. Come on, baby. When Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the next step for him was to be <coughs> tempted of the devil in the wilderness. Matthew, it tells us that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, Matthew 4, 1. Amen? Now, I mean, I, I don't know what Jesus was doing. Maybe he was doing carpentry work or maybe whatever he was doing. But here, here came the manifestation of God and the time appointed in his life. God shows up, and the next thing you know, he goes into the wilderness. Did he just go for a stroll in the park? Did he go for a couple of days? A week. Maybe he went for 40 days. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, when, when has the Spirit moved you to go away with him? And did you go? How long was it? Was it 10 minutes? Was it 30 minutes? Was it an hour? Maybe it was a day, two days, maybe it was a week. Maybe it was two months. I don't know, but here's the thing is we, we cannot hide ourselves from our own flesh, we, but we can't hide ourselves either in realizing, is God moving in my life? Right. He either is or he isn't. Now, we can look at Jesus. Let me, let me tell you, if Jesus needed to be driven into the wilderness, we all need to be driven into the wilderness. Amen. Yes. Jesus was taken away from his comforts. He was taken away from all the things. But it wasn't so he could go on a scouting trip or anything like that. It was so that he could be alone with the Holy Ghost. Because there, there was some, some temptations and some trials. The Holy Ghost knew he was that Jesus was going to come into. And there was some preparing that the Holy Ghost was doing in his life to prepare him for what was about to come. Amen? Amen. Amen. But in Matthew it says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. <coughs> we were talking about the Holy Ghost being not just a mighty wind, but a rushing wind. When a driving force. Well, when you read over in Mark, it states that immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Amen? Now, that drove was not like, you know, get, get in there. He, he pushed him. He, he moved him to go 
into the wilderness. And, and there's no conflict in what he's talking about because it, it's all one and the same thing. Can we say to a man who's sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading, there's a compulsion to obey when the Spirit speaks, even in a gentle voice. Jesus knew how to yield to the wind. In other words, God doesn't have to shake the building in order to, he should not have to shake the building in order to get our attention. Yes. What has to happen into our, in our life before we realize that God wants some God time with us? Amen. Amen. What, what has to happen? Now, I mean, I'm, I've been in the ministry 32 years, and, and that's not very long compared to all the people that's been out there. I kind of paid attention. I, I tried to take notes. I figured there'd be a test at the end of that thing. But I found out that even ministers, most that I've met over the years, they wait till all hell breaks loose before it's time to pray, before it's time to take action. All the other prayers are, are little gentle things. I'm going to tell you, most of our prayers needs to be, Father, fix me. Amen. Amen. That needs to be the main focus. <coughs> and when you do, the wind of God's going to begin to move you. He's going to blow you out of your comfort zone. But I'm going to tell you, we, man, we are creatures of habit. We love to do the things we love to do. That's just the way it is. And, and when the Spirit starts in your mind, He'll say, you know, you can turn that TV off and just go in there and spend a little time with me. Amen. Well, I will Ball. just as soon as this is over. Huh? Ball game. Ball game, same thing. And, and, I mean, no matter what it is, the, the Spirit sometimes will lead us, and sometimes He'll drive you. But the truth is, they're one and the same thing. It's still the Holy Ghost moving you into what He wants you to do and where He wants you to be. <coughs> but Jesus knew how to yield to the wind, and we need to know how to yield to the same wind. The wind also has a cleansing or a purging effect. Excuse me. Job 37, 21 has a way of clearing away the clouds so that we can see the sun clearly. How many knows that when the wind moves in, sometimes the climate changes? Like if there's a cold front coming in and it's been warm, what precedes that coldness? Usually a good amount of wind. Yes. Same way the other way. <coughs> Excuse me. If it's being cold and it's going warm the wind pushes it and drives it so there, but there is that cleansing there is that purging thing remember what they used to do when they were separating the wheat from the chaff yeah. just throw it up into the wind the wind knew how to do it yeah. and guess what it worked right. amen there's so many things that we have to understand it and remember all of the things we're talking about is directly associated with who we are. That he is in our life to do all of those things, to be all of those things in us and to us so he can do it through us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We're almost to the, I hope to the end of this thing. When the wind humbles or withers that which is in its path, Isaiah 40, uh, verse 6 through 8. Come on, baby. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower faith, because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Amen. What do you think was blowing? What do you think the, the Spirit of God was blowing on the grass, which were the people? The word. Yes. And, and I'm going to tell you, if we put ourselves and find ourselves in a position where we're hearing the word and hearing the word and hearing the word and it's not, it's not enabling us or empowering us or enlivening us, we can begin to wither. There, becomes, there is an accountability to hearing what the Spirit is saying. Yes. Yes, sir. At some point, we, we have to understand that the weight of responsibility of that word, just like Isaiah here says, is that we can find ourselves to where the responsibility, it's the same as disobedience. 
it's the same as rebellion to hear the word and give it no credibility. Right. To, to hear and, and be in the place where the spirit is touching and ministering and it not alter our life in any way, but it's just a case of raw, sir, raw thing. Whatever will be, will be. And, and what we find out is that the enemy can be empowered because of our disobedience or our inactivity uh, or our decision to not really be taught or educated by what the Spirit of God is communicating to us. And what the enemy will begin to do is to come in and start trying to dry out your life. Start trying to zap your strength, zap your energy, zap your health, start trying to do anything he can because the disobedience that we have, instead, instead of hearing the word that empowers us, it, it actually becomes a tool where the enemy comes in and, and usually here's what would happen is that the enemy coming in and hitting us and afflicting us moves us to a place where we cry out to God, which is where we should have been in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Praise God. I, I know we're about to the end of the time. <coughs> he dispersed the strength of David and made him cry out. I'm a worm, Psalm 22, 6. He dispersed the self-righteousness of Paul by the blowing and the wind of the Spirit made him claim, I'm carnal. He dispersed the self-excellence of Job, made him confess, I'm vile, in Job 40 and verse 4. And, and the design of God was to let the Spirit do the work in their life. Look what happened to Job, for instance. Look what Paul went through. You would think the man of God, Paul, the, the, the called apostolic gift to the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile alike, that he had been carried around by the, by the Spirit and the wind of God, and nothing would ever come near him. No. Got the crap beat out of him all the time. He, he got tossed into the perils of false brethren. He was stoned three times, received 39 stripes. I, I mean, perils in, in the waters. I mean, everything was going on trying to afflict him. But the thing was, is God still carried out his work. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. He also dispersed the self-satisfaction of Isaiah and made him proclaim, I am a man of unclean lips. When we think we're where we ought to be, we ought to be concerned a little bit. Because when, when God says you're where you ought to be, you're where you ought to be. Mm -hmm. But when you start thinking you're where you ought to be, a lot of times we're comparing ourselves with other people. Now, biblically, it says that's evil. To think, well, I'm doing more than Bobby's doing, or I'm doing more than Mr. Allison's doing. That don't mean the squat. Are you doing in your life what the Holy Ghost is blowing on your life to do? And, and when we are basically approved, and the Holy Ghost says, you're doing everything I told you to do. We have communications from the Lord that says, when, when you reach that point, say, I'm unprofitable. Yes, sir. Now, you know what that does? That self-abasement. That, that keeps self out of the way. Right. It's, it's never, look at me. Because that's what gets us in big trouble. The very issue you say, look at me, the enemy goes, oh, I see you. Thanks for popping your head up. I think I'll come over and put a couple of knots on that. That's what the enemy does with but the simple thing is, is when you have reached and accomplished everything you think you ought to do, then the best thing to simply do is what Jesus said to do, say, I'm an unprofitable. At this point, I did everything I should have done anyway. Mm. Amen? Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. He dispersed the self-acting of Peter and made him say, I'm a sinful man. The Spirit does these things so that he can bless us and use us as pure outlets and, and, and ambassadors of his power and his authority in the world. If, if we won't let him work in us, what makes us ever think we're going to let him work through us? We, we have to gain that confidence. We have to challenge ourselves. We have to let the Holy Ghost of God not just become manifest, but become active and effective in our life. And the more we do, the more we understand that he's there to do that, the more I believe we'll be in agreement and let him, permit him, and yield to him to do the things 
that he's there to do anyway. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the opportunity to be together this morning, Lord, for these things. And, and Lord, we just ask that you just continue to, to move us into the place of truth, into the place of where the living word is carrying us, Lord, that we move out of our comfort zone and, and just allow ourselves to be driven by your wind or to be led by your wind. Whatever the case is, Father, we just want to be where you want us to be doing what you want us to be doing. And we know that right now you're exposing us to us. You, you are making us known to us who we really are. And we yield to that. And we just let your communications, Lord, sink into our hearing and ask, Father, and Holy Ghost of God, that you establish us in the truth that is present with us. We give you all the praise, all the honor and glory, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Take the time.